Hi, Rob. Thank you. Um, so I thought for my last talk, um, I, I would focus on, on an open problem that's related to the theme of, of many of the talks in this mini course. In some sense, this will be more closely related to what Michelle's been talking about, for example, uh, than what I have. Um, and so, all right, so now we ho I hope that you view hyperbolic three manifolds as your friends or at least um, acquaintances. I started off at the beginning of my first lecture, uh, the introductory lecture, uh, talking about one corollary of geometrization, right? Which is that three manifold groups are residually finite. So I just wanted to come back to that because that'll be a, so in particular, precisely um, if uh, M3 is a closed, uh, three manifold, um, then its fundamental group uh, is residually finite, i.e. the intersection of subgroups of finite index. Um, the intersection of all the subgroups of finite index is just the identity element. Um, and if you did your homework in Michelle's class, you know this is equivalent to her, the definition that she gave. Um, and uh, so I'd just like to go ahead and explain uh, how this is a corollary of geometrization. Um, Michelle touched on this, but I want to prove something somehow during my talks. Um, so first, what you do is, you know, we start by using the decompositions into prime pieces and then cut the prime pieces up by those JSJ tori to reduce to the case of geometric pieces. Um, and most of the pieces are cypher fiber. The most kinds of pieces are cypher fiber. We understand those. So really the, the hard case is the hyperbolic case. So we'll use the prime and JSJ decompositions to produce uh, to when uh, M uh, is hyperbolic. Uh, and that tells us, right, that we can view the fundamental group of M um, as a subgroup of the isometry group of hyperbolic space, uh, namely PSL2C. Right? So it tells us that we have a group of matrices. Um, and then we apply a theorem of Balsev from 1940, um, which says that uh, any finitely generated linear group is residually finite. An infinitely generated subgroup of, I don't know, let's just say GLNC uh, is residually finite. Um, but given how crucial this is, let me explain the proof of Molsev's theorem. Um, this is not hard. No, I, I mean, so this was done by Hempel. Um, it's a non trivial argument. Um, you're going along Tori, you have to make sure that, like, you're the, the, the um, subgroups you're constructing on the pieces match across those tori, um, but uh, it's, it's not so bad. Um, yes. Sorry? Don't get it at book D now, other than the book D finite? Um, Don't you get it at the book D now? It's an open problem whether every three minus four pieces can be. Yeah. The geometric problem. So um, more questions, comments? Um, so what's the proof of this? Sorry, someone had a question? This works over any field. Yes, absolutely. I was just being, it's, it's after lunch. I know everyone's tired. I'm tired, it's my fourth lecture. Yeah, complex numbers, my friends, but absolutely, the field is irrelevant. Okay, so, um, so what's the proof? Well. I'm just going to give an example and explain to you why this example is essentially universal. Um, so what's a finitely generated group of matrices? How about SL3Z? Okay. Um, and we want to find a subgroup of this of finite index. Uh, and that's basically the same as finding a finite quotient of this group. Well, how do I find a quotient of this? I just pick an integer. Um, and I look at the map um, to SL2 of Z mod NZ. Oh, sorry. <laughs> that would indeed be an interesting approach. Uh, the reason I'm doing SL3 instead of SL2 is that SL2 is actually secretly a free group or virtually a free group. And so there's another method that works in that case. 
worried someone would bring up. Um, so we have this map um, to this, and this turns out to be onto, um, not that it's particularly important. Um, and so then we just look at the kernel. Um, and so this is what's called, this term came up in Ian's lectures. Uh, this is what's called a principal congruent subgroup um, of level n. Um, but it just, this just consists of matrices in here, which are congruent to the identity matrix modulo n. Right, so you reduce the entries modulo n and just diagonal ones, that's it. That's those matrices. So in particular, as n gets larger, um, this thing gets smaller. Um, and in particular, if I take the intersection of all of these guys, this is definitely just the trivial group, trivial elements. And so that, in this case, is, is the proof. Now, you might say, um, this looks awful special. I mean, it doesn't look so different than this, right? And here, I mean, the entries here, these are um, Gaussian integers. I mean, that's the kind of situation you do have in the three-manifold world. These will be like algebraic numbers of some kind. Um, but, but really, the point is that our group is finitely generated, our subgroup. Um, and consequently, there's really finitely many entries in those matrices. And so those entries live in some finitely generated ring over Z. And any ring like that has a bunch of ideals. Right here, what we're doing, we're quotienting out by this ideal. Um, and that ring turns out um, to have enough ideals that you can always do this. So this is not, in fact, nearly as specific as it looks. Are there questions? So maybe this is a good point to pause and emphasize really the role of geometry, geometrization theorem um, has in this. This is the only proof. Uh, I mean, all proofs of this fact that I know of, which this is the easiest, um, use geometrization. Um, and, and so, you know, this is a kind of an algebraic factor. I like to think about it as a geometric fact. It's saying that if your three manifold is not the three sphere, it has a finite cover. Um, but the way the proof goes is you hand me a three manifold, the closed three manifold, I'm supposed to find a cover for it. Um, the reason I know it has a cover is, well, I put some Ramanian metric on it, just some arbitrary bumpy, bumpy thing. Um, and then you start Hamilton's Ricci flow on that three manifold. And this is a sort of like a heat equation for Ramanian metric. So it kind of tries to smooth things out locally. It's a weakly parabolic partial differential equation. It can develop singularities in finite time. So the flow just blows up. Um, and Perlman's key contribution actually is to analyze the singularities, classify the singularities that do arise um, and tell you sort of how to sort of go through them and, and get on with your life. But the, these singularities correspond to like collapsing along spheres. So they're like, they're, they're back undoing the prime decomposition theorem. Um, anyway, so you, you, things bubble off and whatever, but eventually the flow kind of, um, you know, settles down and maybe in the limit, perhaps it converges to say a nice hyperbolic metric on your manifold. And that's a very rigid analytic thing, right? Isometries, once you have to tell you where a point and a frame is and where it goes, that determines the whole map. And it's that sort of analyticity uh, that is telling us this algebraic fact that we have a bunch of matrices. And it's from that bunch of matrices that we're getting these subgroups. And so certainly possible there's some proof that of this fact that doesn't go through geometrization. That has evaded uh, everyone. Are there questions on my little soliloquy? So uh, what do I actually want to talk about um, today? Uh, um, I want to talk about finite covers of three manifolds. So in the coral areas, we've got lots of them. And um, as my prejudices have made clear, I'm going to be interested in hyperbolic manifolds. Um, and in particular, I'm going to be interested in uh, what happens if we take lots of, you know, take lots of covers of a, of a single manifold. So let's just say uh, M3 is a closed hyperbolic three manifold. Um, so uh, I'm going to look at, say, a tower of covers, finite covers. So I start off here with my initial manifold, and then the corollary says I get a finite cover of that. Maybe it's one of these congruence covers, maybe not. 
Um, and then I said, oh, that was a lot of fun. So I take a finite cover of that. And I keep going, nothing to stop us. Um, and I'll say a co tower of covers like this uh, exhausts uh, M when I'd like all these covers to be regular over the base manifold. So in other words, pi R1 of MI is a normal subgroup, I1 of M. Um, uh, and uh, there's sort of co-final. So the intersection of these subgroups is trivial. Yes, maybe. Yes, that's correct. Yeah, so, 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 so th there's no argument that, to my knowledge, that tells you that um, a three manifold with non-trivial fundamental group has a finite cover. Other, other, other than this one I just gave, which sort of trivially gives residual finiteness on top of it. Um, okay, so this is the notion of, of, of sort of an exhaustive tower of covers. Um, and if you object to the fact that I kind of went from the geometric to the algebraic point of view here, which I kind of do, to be honest, but apologies. Um, so this is equivalent to saying that if we look at the injectivity radius of these manifolds, which um, Ian defined, but let me remind you, it's one half the length of the shortest uh, closed loop, closed essential loop, geodesic. Um, this condition is equivalent to this thing um, going to infinity as I goes to infinity. So just saying that if I take any, any essential loop in M, then as I go up the tower, eventually that loop is unwound. And then it's unwound again. And so, so any, any bit of the topology in the base disappears somewhere along this, along this tower. Um, and so I'm going to be interested in this situation. What can we say about the topology um, and uh, geometry of these manifolds? And we already saw in Ian's lectures questions about what happens to the Hegard genus, uh, what happens to the rank. Don't really know uh, often what that what happens there, um, and uh, but I my last lecture, so I'm I'm, I'm going to think about something even simpler. Um, I'm going to ask uh, what happens to the homology. It's the ordinary first homology, um, and well, okay, it's the, some finitely generated abelian group, so it's got like a free part. Uh, and then there's the torsion part, subgroup of elements of finite order. Um, and, and this part, I mean, this is the part that has sort of immediate geometric meaning, right? Because this corresponds to the first cohomology or Poincaré dual, the second homology. So this corresponds to surfaces. Um, in fact, if you like, we can make them incompressible surfaces, even better. Uh, and so as Michelle explained this morning, uh, if you have any hyperbolic manifold, you can find some cover uh, where this um, free part is as big as you want. Um, and you know that corresponds again to having lots of lots of surfaces. Um, I'm going to focus instead on the other part because I want to talk about um, some conjectures. Even just for a fixed manifold, uh, except for stuff that involves two torsion. I mean, two torsion is about sort of non-orientable surfaces. Uh, but if you look at other, anything other than two, like you know, maybe this group has a factor which is Z mod 31,991, okay? Or maybe, I don't know, Z mod 32,002, oh, sorry, three. This actually is now a cyclic group. These are co-prime. They're also prime, by the way, anyway. Um, but anyway, if, if I took a cover and I told you told you that I had this in the, in the homology, I, I don't know what this means, okay? Um, it doesn't seem to be good for much, um, but uh, I mean, it can be useful to distinguish manifolds apart, right? So, you know, when you, when you actually practically solve the homeomorphism problem, and I wanna tell you two manifolds are different, a really effective way in practice is to take say finite covers of them, like finite covers of degree 10, Look at how many of those you have. Look at their homology. That's like a whole bunch of sort of random numbers that are associated with that manifold. 
And those are often different. So it's, it's important conjecture about um, sort of profinite rigidity, whether that sort of thing would always work, for example, to distinguish hyperbolic manifolds. Um, I was going to talk about that, but I, I realized I'm just not going to have time. Um, so anyway, th th these are useful numbers, but just, but just sort of as, you know, it tells you things are different. It doesn't really tell you. Um... All right. Okay, but uh, so despite that, uh, in the context here I have of these exhaustive covers, it will turn out that um, there is conjectured to be a meaning for this torsion. Um, and uh, so uh, let me go ahead and write that here. So the conjecture I'm about to make has many variants um, discovered independently. And also, I mean, a lot of it's really motivated by earlier work of Wolfgang Luke, um, but I'll state it in the following way. Uh, so here's the conjecture for this afternoon. Um, so in this form, it was proposed by Bergeron and Venkatesh. So these are number theorists. This is a field's metals, actually Venkatesh, um, but also they did it for sort of lattices in, in general, semi-simple groups. The three manifold communities, Thang Lei formulated independently a very similar uh, conjecture. And as I said, really, one of these ideas would do the work. Okay, so here's the, here's the uh, um, statement. So suppose M is a closed another adjective, arithmetic, hyperbolic. And it's not clear you really need this hypothesis or some of the hypothesis will come later, but I'm gonna state it in the form where there's sort of overwhelming evidence that this is true. And then I'll um, talk about sort of what maybe is the sort of weakest thing that is true. Um, and uh, then suppose we have an exhaustive tower. So suppose our exhaustive uh, tower of finite covers, and I'm gonna make them uh, congruence covers. So I mean that they really come from that construction in the proof of Molsev's theorem. That's what congruence means. Um, okay, so then, um, so in this situation, uh, let's look at the just, you know, I said I'm gonna look at the homology of these covers. And as I said, I'm, like, I'm interested in the torsion part. I'm gonna pretend we know everything about the free part, which we don't really, but anyway. Um, we're gonna look at the torsion part. So this is some finitely generated abelian group, right? Well, it's not just finitely generated, it's a finite abelian group. So we can ask how many elements is in this? Um, and the conjecture is that this group is actually non-trivial when N is, is large. In fact, um, it's really big. So if we take the number of elements, which I guess is what that notation was supposed to mean. If I take the number of elements, this is going to grow exponentially quickly in the volume of the manifold. Um, so in particular, if I take the logarithm of this and divide by the volume, then the conjecture is that the limit as n goes to infinity of this quantity exists um, and is a universal constant one on six pi. Um, so that, that is the, the conjecture. Um, pretty quickly. Um, so I'm going to show you in a minute some actual data um, in favor of this conjecture. Um, and, and, and so you can decide whether you think it's quick or not. But yeah, there's overwhelming experimental evidence. For this. Um, well, since I made them normal, I'm more or less saying principal. Yeah, yeah. It's not clear they really need to be principal, actually. Uh, probably they don't. So let me rewrite this since this is a, a group theory workshop um, in part. Um, and uh, so... Well, we're talking about the first homology. So that first homology is just the abelianization of the fundamental group, right? We're taking the abelianization of the fundamental group. We're just looking at the torsion part um, and looking at the growth rate of this with respect to the volume. I don't really want to refer to the volume because that's maybe doesn't sound very uh, group theory, right? But the volume of this, this is going to be um, the volume of the base manifold. Um, times the degree of the cover from MN down to M. Um, so, and this is just the index, right? That's the same as the index 
of pi one of m n inside uh, pi one of m. Um, and so I can take this, I won't write the volume here, I'll move the volume to the other side. So this is equivalent to saying the limit as n goes to infinity of this is the volume of the base manifold times the constant. Um, so in particular, um, so this one is arithmetic. I realize it's not closed, but you don't actually need that hypothesis. Um, and uh, so here's its volume. Um, and so the conjecture says, as we start taking suitable covers of this manifold or suitable subgroups of this group, you look at their homology, um, we're going to start seeing approximations to this number um, when we compute uh, this, this quantity. I mean, this is, I think, quite remarkable. Um, I mean, in some sense, right, we already know from Mostow rigidity that um, the geometry of the manifolds recovered completely from the fundamental group, right? The fundamental group determines the, the you know, if the fundamental group of a hyperbolic manifold in dimension bigger than or equal to three determines the geometry. So in particular, this topology determines this volume. Um, so it's not, we know that somehow the volume is encoded in um, the fundamental group of our original manifold M, um, but this is saying, this is how it's one way in which it's encoded. Are there questions? Yes. Uh, what if you take any sequence of say pairwise on conjugate arithmetic lattices? Oh yeah, so, so as we'll see in a minute. So, so there's going to be a variant of this conjecture if we just cover this up. Um, um, so this really shouldn't depend too much well. We don't understand it. So I, I should say this has been proved for exactly zero towers of covers of anything. <laughs> There's not one example. We do not know this for the figure eight exterior. Okay. Um, but uh, but yes, this ar arithmeticity is probably not really. Uh, Maha. Yes, this is, this is, yeah. Uh, yeah. Yes, well, so I'm gonna give you in, in just a second uh, some data. Um, and, but then there is sort of a theoretical uh, underpinning of this, uh, which I, I, will, I will allude to it towards the end. Um, yeah, so there's both theoretical and sort of experimental justification of this. Maybe. Well, I mean, the sense is it's almost certainly false without it, but, um, but some slight variant of it will be true. Uh, congruence is something that makes sense whether you're arithmetic or not. It's also not clear I need congruence. It may just be exhaustive is enough. That's quite pos possible. But, but um, yeah, we don't know. It's about open questions. Yes. Uh, so there isn't any torsion in higher homology, right? Because in a three manifold, like H2 is torsion free. Um, uh, because because H lower two is isomorphic to H upper one, which is torsion free. So in general, I should say, I mean, I'm, again, I'm focusing on three manifolds because uh, that's that's where I live. But really, this is a conjecture about general lattices and semi-simple groups. Um, in any given semi-simple group, there's at most one dimension in which you might see torsion, a lot of torsion. Um, like for example, if we instead did hyperbolic two manifolds, then there's no torsion. Right, H, there's no torsion in H, you know, for an orientable manifold, there's no torsion at all. Um, but, you know, if you did SL3R, there's one dimension, I think it's three, maybe it's two, that you might have this kind of torsion. Dave? Well, they, they had some data of their own. Um, no, they did. I mean, I'm going to show you some data, which is my data, because that's the one I have on my computer, but I was not certainly not um, the first to do these kind of calculations. Uh, Thing about the torsion, and say how many, what's the minimum number of signs? Ah, uh, uh, yes, yes. You could ask, like, what's the, yeah, in particular, like, what's the, what's the number of generators of this group? Um, and the answer is, uh, we expect it to be quite small. That's what it is in practice. And there's also theoretical reasons to believe that um, this is certainly not the number of of generators is not going to grow um, exponentially. So, so for this to happen, it means that like new prime, it'll turn out what it'll mean is that new primes have to constantly be appearing in this thing. 
This is not getting big because you get a whole bunch of copies of 32,003 in this. Um, it's because you keep adding new, longer, bigger, crazier primes. Okay, can we uh, cue the lights? Um, so while it's getting set up, let me just write over here so we can have it up while the board is hidden. Um, so let me just define, if I have a three manifold, um, let me define the torsion ratio um, to be the quantity that's in the conjecture that just got covered up. So we'll take log of the size of the first homology Z coefficients torsion part um, divide by the volume. And, uh, and I'm going to multiply this by six pi um, so that the conjecture becomes that the torsion ratio uh, converges to one. Okay. So thank you. Um, is there a way to kill the light immediately above? Thank you. Okay, so um, here are some data about um, a bunch of um, arithmetic hyperbolic three manifolds, technically orbifolds. Um, so let's see. So in this case, so this is um, data from a paper mine with Jeff Brock, um, but uh, Hal Luke Singun had, had done computations like this prior to us. Um, so there, are, so we start off with eleven manifolds, eleven Ms. And for each one, we took about a thousand of these congruence covers. Uh, there's a total of fifteen thousand covers involved, and each dot uh, represents one cover. So this little red dot here represents a cover whose volume was pushing twenty thousand, um, and the torsion ratio for this guy was about 0.9. Um, and uh, so you remember that bromine rings there; its volume was seven. Okay, so these are a lot more complicated than that. Um, and so anyway, this is now 15,000 dots. Um, and as you can see, as the volume gets bigger, uh, the dots get closer to the line at height one, entirely consistent with this uh, conjecture. I have questions about this one. Ah, yes. So what do the colors mean? So the colors mean uh, have to do with the free part of the homology, the, just the Betty number. So um, uh, let me double check my notes. Uh, yeah, red um, means the first Betty number of the manifold um, is positive. So there's some free part to your first homology. And blue means that it's one, zero, sorry. So there's no free part to your homology. These are the rational homology spheres uh, in language I think we heard about earlier. Um, and what you might notice is that it feels like there's roughly equal numbers of red and blue dots on this. Um, actually, I get well, roughly equal 35% are red dots, the rest are blue dots. Um, and you can see that the red dots seem to be shifted down a little compared to the blue dots. Um, and I don't think it's advancing the slides. Could you, Max, could you just push the button? Oh, did I turn off the clicker? Ah, uh, thank you. Um, so this is a histogram of the data for the red and for the blue. Um, so, so here I just cut it off. Like I, I just took things of volume at least 15,000. So sort of the tail on the last one. And this is the histogram of the red, the histogram of the blue, and you do see it shifted slightly down. And we'll come back to that in, in just a minute. This, this is what sort of the limit at which we could compute, compute things. Slides. There is a curve suggesting that uh, you have some collection term uh, governed by some function. Um, sorry. I mean, the, the shape of this graph. Of the... Oh, you mean this sort of. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, well, that's just the convergence. Yeah, but seems that there is a specific limit to them all that. So. Yeah, I mean, what one might well conjecture. Yeah. Oh, you mean like, I mean, like, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, you should conjecture this is like normally distributed. I mean, it's like these kind of analytic number theory things. I think you should sort of say everything should be like super nice. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Um, so the hypothesis of arithmetic featured prominently in, in there, um, which again, I, I define as those the number theorists care about or I can tell us stuff about. Um, here are some non-arithmetic manifolds. Um, so this is, I, I think this came, we started with 20, 20 manifolds. And again, we took 
like about 1500 covers of each of them. Um, so there's like 30,000 dots here now. Uh, and so one thing you notice is there's dramatically fewer red dots. Like only like 2% of the dots are red or something. It's almost all blue. So that means that there's, for most of these things, there's no uh, free part to the first homology. Um, so um, that's how it is. Um, and, and also now we see um, some real outliers in terms of the red dots. Um, and, uh, and yeah, that's, that's, that's what you see. Um, and this is, uh, sorry, are there questions on this one? Um, so this is a histogram of the uh, data from the first slide compared to the, the third one. So the green, these are the arithmetic ones. Um, and the blue is the non-arithmetic ones. And again, it's cut off with the volumes at least 15,000. Um, and uh, what you see actually, despite the conjecture being about arithmetic things, that once I throw out the red dots, because I, I, I don't use the blue ones here, um, uh, the non-arithmetic ones are actually converging faster. Uh, which certainly suggests that there should be a, a, a theorem there um, in the non-arithmetic case. Um, and and I, I'm told by number theorists that you actually expect this somehow. The, 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 the fact that the non-arithmetic ones converge more quickly is an expected phenomenon, which I do not understand well enough to attempt to explain to you. It's all hyperbolic. And I, I really should have said, um, all of these are coming, both, both the ones here and the ones here, they're all coming from a family of orbifolds, which topologically seem indistinguishable. So these are all coming from twist knot orbifolds. So these are things where you um, have a, a knot where you put in some number of twists here, and some number of twists here. So it's like two parameters. All these things are of this form. Um, and some of them are arithmetic and some of them not. So they're like when these are really small, they're arithmetic. And as you increase it a few times, they're non-arithmetic. So like if I gave you the group presentations between the first slide and this slide, you couldn't tell them apart. They would just look like this, you know, like some relator instead of taking it to the cube, you're now taking it to the fourth. And yet that has this dramatic effect in terms of how much homology there is in these covers. And that really is the fact that these are, the, the, error, the arithmeticity has huge consequences, uh, even though you can't, as far as I can tell, see it from them. Um, not beyond that, there's no sort of a priori reason to expect covers to have any bedding up. Um, yeah, so these are orbifold, so, it, it, so it's a branch cover. No, because the, these are usually torsion-free covers. Yeah. You can, yes, you can. Um, uh, but, but in fact, as we'll see in a second, um, these are congruence covers. We don't know that congruence covers always have positive bedding numbers. Um, and, I, I, and certainly you can, you can find families which don't. Are there other questions? Um, not, not as you go up, not, you know, so, so you can certainly using the virtually special machinery, you can certainly construct covers in which you have tremendous amounts of torsion. In fact, Han Bing Sun and possibly collaborators um, showed that you give me a finitely generated abelian group, and a hyperbolic manifold, you could find a finite cover of that hyperbolic manifold where that abelian group appears in its homology. Okay. Um, and and, and so, so there are covers where it's big. There's no reason we know that these covers will be big and in particular that these will increase um, at, at these kind of rates. Why does this conjecture not contradict the fifth price conjecture? Oh, well, that, that comes back to Mahan's question about like the. This is not telling us about the rank of these groups. But it's a right hand group. Um, but I'm just looking at the torsion part. Is it? Okay. 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 Of course, as you start taking covers, you no longer. Uh, actually coming from a right angled reflections, right? Because you've become torsion free and that will exhaust, the, but those aren't regular covers. The regular covers will, will lose their torsion quickly. Out of the rest of the, the most general mm -hmm. so, the, so some, yeah, you're saying it, it will not be true for 
like or if you take over the you know, index to if you take the cohesion, take a double, then you take another double and so on. It's just because of normal Yeah. It's normal one Yeah, it's normal one. I don't know. I don't know. No, well, that's really interesting. Um, why don't we shut this off for now? Um, and uh, unless there are other questions about the pretty pictures. Wow, we'll lose the pretty pictures. Um, yes, yes. There are conjectures about how the free part grows. And um, in particular, it's a theorem. Um, so uh, I'm going to attribute this to Luke, but, but it's probably... Um, maybe due to someone else. Certainly he proved things of this form. Um, so you know that in this situation, if we look at the first Betty number of this divide by the volume, this will always go to zero. Um, so so this, this, of course, zero appears many places in mathematics. Um, this is the first L2 Betty number of hyperbolic space. So the very general theorems, when you start taking like a tower of covers of, of a cell complex, that say, if you look at the um, rational homology in any dimension of that, and you normalize it um, to account for the fact you're unwinding stuff, then those ratios will have limits, which are these L2 Betty numbers of your space. Um, so we do actually understand sort of what happens to the free part. It doesn't grow. It can't grow that fast. This is Dudu. Kajnan, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Thank you, Gore. Well, yes, um, um, th 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 that's the fastest it can grow. Um, you know, because you're thinking about, you have some cell complex, right? And you take a cover of it. So you have some triangulation um, and you take a giant cover of it. And you think about your matrix that you use to compute the homology. It's a matrix that's gonna be very sparse because it's, you know, it comes from a triangulation and the local common torques downstairs are bounded. So this is like saying you're looking at the determinant of this large matrix whose rows are sort of bounded norm. The fastest that determinant can grow is exponential in the size of the matrix. Yeah, so this is saying as fast as possible. And, and so I'm putting up theorem, so we do know some things, it's worth mentioning. Um, so Fang Lei proved um, that uh, in this situation, that the uh, torsion ratio of these manifolds, um, that the limb soup uh, is at most one. So this is really the fastest it could possibly grow. Our right, questions? Nope, nope. And in fact, it's any co-final sequence. For three manifolds, yeah. Okay, so, um, Okay, so I just want to modify the, the conjecture I had to allow non-arithmetic things. Um, we saw that the presence of Betty numbers seemed to be screwing things up. So we will just sort of ignore that part. So let's say we can drop arithmetic um, from hypothesis if we insist that the Betty numbers, the free part, is zero. There's also a conjecture where you don't do this, but I don't. I don't have time to introduce it. Can you replace congruence? Uh, congruence makes perfect. Congruence still makes sense whether you're arithmetic or not. Like congruence means the thing in Maltzev's theorem. So even if you're that, it's like you know you think like you know any hyperbolic three manifold has an associated number field. You can always conjugate it so that the, the the matrices, the holonomial matrices, end up in basically the ring of integers in that number field. So it has a perfect notion of congruence. Um, it just, you lose the number of theoretic tools um, to tell you about what's going on. Gregorian, um, that have which property? Oh, here? Um, yes, I think there should be. Okay, yes, yeah, so that's the next theorem. So, um, perfect. Um, so this is, Old work of mine with, um, this is Frank Caligari, not Danny. He's a number theorist. That's what you need for this. And also uh, Nigel Boston and Jordan Ellenberg, 2006. 
Um, so we showed that there are um, arithmetic and non-arithmetic M with um, exhaustive congruence towers uh, with no free part of their homology. So you can, um, uh, they're, they're not, not only do you not, so in fact, we know that you touched on that to sort of, you don't have so much homology in these things. And in fact, you can, you can arrange for it to be nothing. Mark, sure, absolutely, absolutely. Yes. Are there many folks that are like, know that it's not possible to get all the rows? Um, yes. The question is, is yeah, are there manifolds where you know it's not possible to get all zeros? Um, no, actually, I, I think it's it's conceivable that you always have a tower that 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 has all zeros. Yes. So so um, so for 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 arithmetic things, sometimes you you can say something. Um, for non-arithmetic things, uh, I think we have no clue. Um, so uh, so I I want to say um, uh, so so really. I need to put like a big asterisk next to our contribution here um, in the sense that uh, we prove this um, uh, assuming the generalized Riemann hypothesis. Plus Langlands for GL2, but that was sort of small potatoes uh, in the context of GRH. Um, so the point is our original examples where well, they were arithmetic examples. Um, and, and so you can use the machinery that you use to prove Fermat's last theorem. You kind of run it backwards. Um, to tell you that there's no cohomology in these particular manifolds, starting from something about a particular elliptic curve. Um, but it, it turns out that the uh, manifold, the manifold we found was really actually concrete. So you could, we described the first number theoretically, but then um, uh, we were able to draw a picture. So it's actually an orbifold. Um, so the underlying space is the two sphere, and this is the singular locus. Um, like so. Um, anyway, this is this with our base manifold. Um, and then it turns out that you can actually analyze this example. This is what Austin Elberg did uh, using the machinery of pro P groups um, rather than this automorphic form stuff. Um, and from there, you can actually give an unconditional proof that the congruence covers we built had no um, uh, Betty number. Um, and then, in fact, you can then use their ideas. And, and construct non-arithmetic examples using the same technique. Um, so we reproduced, I know, a few dozen families uh, of, of these things where, where you have this, this lack of homology. So it's not like somehow, so, so you know, the conjecture is about, there's lots of torsion. And this is saying, well, actually, there doesn't have to be any free part. Um, and we know that, that asymptotically, there's not that much of it anyway. So um, I guess the, the last thing I, the last, the last 10 minutes, I want to just say a little bit more about how you can try to think about these things and kind of probe the, what the right hypotheses of the general conjecture are. So I just need one last definition for today. Um, so we already learned about the injectivity radius of a manifold. Um, I want to talk about the injectivity radius of a manifold at a point. So if I look at a point, right, this is a hyperbolic manifold, as all of them are. Uh, and you know, if I take a little metric ball about this point, then that's isometric to a ball in hyperbolic space, right? And then as I increase the radius, the gets sort of larger and larger until eventually the ball sort of bumps into itself. Um, so let's define sort of that maximum radius. That's the injectivity radius at P. Um, this is the um, supremum of epsilon so that the ball radius epsilon about P is isometric uh, to a ball in hyperbolic space. I mean, of course, this varies, depends on what point we're at. So, you know, here in my cartoon, it will be larger than at say this point here, right? The injectivity radius would be lower there. And then the injectivity radius of the manifold, which is what we heard about already, um, this is just the uh, infimum 
of the injectivity radius. So, you know, this will be achieved at points that are on the shortest closed geodesic. So, you know, we want to try to interpret this conjecture somehow geometrically. Um, and, uh, you know, we have this tower of covers and the, and the injectivity radius is going to infinity, right? That, that was equivalent to the, the condition that these subgroups intersect trivially. Um, and so we could just think about that kind of notion of convergence. So, so let me introduce the following uh, concept. So I, I apologize, I have one more definition. Um, so let's say a sequence of flows hyperbolic three manifolds um, converge to H3. Um, this will be in a sense of Benjamini Schramm. If um, on any given scale, most of these man for any given scale and large n, most of the manifold looks like hyperbolic space at that scale. So if for all r greater than zero, um, if we look at the set of points in MN where the injectivity radius um, is at least R. So this is the part where it looks like hyperbolic space at to scale R. Um, we'd like this to be most of the manifold. So we'll take the volume of this, divide by the volume of this, and we require this to go to zero. Ah, one, sorry, yes. Yes. Um, and, and so, so this, unlike what I've talked about before, these manifolds are not covers of the same thing. They're not, they don't have, they don't have to be commensurable. This is just some random sequence of manifolds um, that just look more and more like hyperbolic space. So you might think that you could probably prove basically nothing about this, given this information. Um, that's certainly what I would have thought, but I would be wrong. As happens so often. Um, so in fact, um, it's a theorem of uh, Albert's, Bergeron, Beringer, uh, Galanda, Nikolov, Rambat, and Samet, that um, if we have our hyperbolic manifolds converging Benjamini Schramm to H3, then uh, we get the sort of convergence of normalized topology as in the theorem of Kajdan. So, um, Yes, yeah, that's right. I did say his name, yeah, yeah. Yep, that's our barrier. Okay, um, so that the first Betty number divided by the volume, um, this will always go to the Betty number, which ha so happens is zero. Um, so, so this, even though these aren't connected, um, you really sort of see the normalized topology converges. And so a question would be then, uh, would be does this benjamini schramm convergence um, force torsion growth? I mean, maybe this is really the right, the right hypothesis. Um, uh, but the answer is sadly no. Well, I don't know if sadly no, it is no. I shouldn't be so judgmental. <laughs> so uh, Jeff Brock and I proved uh, that uh, the answer is no. Um, so that in particular, there exist um, MN, which converge to hyperbolic space in the sense um, where all of these have no homology whatsoever. So um, not only do they have no free part, they just have no homology. Or the integral homology spheres. And so one of the things I, I said at sort of the beginning uh, is, you know, topology is equal to geometry in dimension three. And you have this existence and then in the hyperbolic case, uniqueness. Uh, and, but I also said, we don't really understand so well how this connection works. Um, and, and so maybe to end, I'm gonna illustrate our ignorance um, rather than our knowledge, probably what I do anyway. Um, so here's a question. Given some R sort of R greater than zero, does there exist um, a 
hyperbolic three manifold uh, with no homology, H1 of M, Z is just zero. So it looks up to homology, it looks like the three sphere. Um, and uh, injectivity radius of M, the length of the shortest geodesic, at least R. Okay. So our examples here, they Benjamini SRAM converge, which means that they have injectivity radius R most places. Um, this is asking, make it the whole thing. And I actually don't have a strong opinion whether the answer to this is yes or no. The thing is that it's easy enough to write down manifolds where you control the homology by using Hagard splittings and just controlling the gluing map. And it's easy enough to build manifolds with the injectivity radius is large. You take big finite covers. Uh, what I don't know how to do is do these both things at once. And of course, as soon as you write down a topological description of your three manifold, by Mostow, you you there's nothing you don't get any choices left. You fix the geometry, um, and so so I think this this is maybe a a good place to stop, kind of illustrating what what we don't know about the linkage between you know topology is geometry. Maybe this is sort of a caveat. So I'll stop there. Thank you. Ah, uh, it's not very big. Um, I'm not sure I could do two, actually. Maybe two. Yeah. Of course, the volume grows exponentially in in, in the radius. Um, uh, but um, but yeah, I, I should say there's a variant of this which is probably technically easier, which I also can't do. Um, is uh, look at a three manifold that fibers over the circle, fiber of surface of genus G, so the homology is just Z to the two G plus one. So it has much homology as it can. So it means that the monodrome is now with a Torelli group. Build elements, build three manifolds, these sort of Torelli bundles where this goes to infinity. Um, uh, almost certainly not. I mean, they're, 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 they're certainly, the way they're written down are not obviously arithmetic and, and, and uh, yeah, I think they probably can't be. Yeah. Now, this is very much a kind of Kleinian groups thing um, where, where you sort of, you take some geometry coming from a, a bundle, you take a big cover of some manifold fibers over the circle, you kind of photocopy that into a Hagard splitting um, in such a way that you control the homology of what you, what you, what you uh, build. So sort of a big portion of it looks like a cover of a three manifold that fibers over the circle. And that's the part where the injectivity radius is large. And then some little bits at the bottom and top where you don't know what's going on, but that's not enough. It turns out to mess up the convergence. Because it's sort of small amounts of volume. Don't do a long gauge No. But probably the art or committee should just take three, right? Um, no idea. I'm sure they're not. I mean, it, it, there's no way. <laughs> Could you come back with uh, red versus blue? Uh, yes. Distribution for my thoughts. I mean, uh, we have any quantity thing to say? I mean, or conjecture to make? Um, I mean, I, I, I think that for, I would guess just based on the, the plot that I, I showed you that um, for non-arithmetic things, it's probably positive Betty number with probability zero. Um, um, but, uh, and there are certain, um, uh, you know, there are sort of models of random manifolds you can talk about based on random Hegard splitting. And there one can show that sort of the probability of, of, of getting homology in the cover is sort of zero, but you're fixing the degree of the cover in a way that maybe is not so natural from this perspective. Um, you know, I should say that, you know, I, I gave you I, the, the sort of, I gave you the picture justification of, of this conjecture because of course I love pictures and I love computation, um, but uh, there's also kind of a more theoretical thing that sort of involves like the Racinger analytic torsion and how it behaves in covers. And it's that Racinger analytic torsion and its relation to the torsion and homology is what accounts for the red dots dropping way to the bottom. Um, it has to do with sort of the size of homology with respect to sort of the harmonic forms um, that kind of can sort of soak up some of this convergence. Um, and this is related to the Thurston norm and, and all sorts of other stuff that I wanted to tell you and I, I didn't have time. Oh yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, it, I mean, the six pi, right? Uh, what, what is one over six pi? So this is, uh, the L2 analytic torsion of H3. 
just as in Luke's uh, Kajan Luke, that this was the um, this sort of L2 Betty number, L2 Betty number. So when the Betty number vanishes, then you're entitled to some kind of torsion. So this has to do with the spectrum of L2 forms on this guy. Um, and so in general, for a semi-simple group, there's maybe one dimension in which you can have torsion growth, in which case the conjectured limit is known. Um, and this is all in, in the paper of Bergeron and Venkatesh that I linked to on the course web page. I want to read. They, they really give a nice um, outline of kind of some motivation of this. And going back to things like looking at cyclic branch covers of a knot and how the Alexander polynomial controls the amount of torsion that appears in those cyclic branch covers. Yes, yes, yes. I, I, I not, not that I'm aware of. Yeah, so the, right, there's this thing about look at the Jones polynomial of a knot as you increase the, the color and, and somehow the volume pops out of that. And I mean, the, the connection I know of is that Fang Lei has thought hard about both of these things. Um, and I think that might've been in the back of his mind when he formulated, he said independently of Bergeron Venkatesh, but, but direct connections, I know of none. Yeah. So in the torsion graph of the sequence of the three manifolds, the fronts that appear that should be appearing in the torsion part, are those associated with the fronts of the Um, of the Um, no, no, they're not. Um, so, so, uh, typically, typically no. Yeah. They're just, they're just random, random stuff. Um, and, and, and you know, you, so, so, um, in, cause in particular, I should say that, um, uh, maybe, yeah, I mean, so, so like the examples of, of, um, Boston Ellenberg, Frank and myself, I mean, these are all congruence covers where the prime is fixed. You're taking powers of the prime. I mean, the thing you actually prove is that the homology at that prime doesn't change. So you're taking like some sequence of basically, you know, degree two covers or degree three covers, and you're looking at the homology mod two or mod three, and it's not even changing. That's sort of the opposite. So the, the, the homology growth, if it happens, which appears to, um, is coming from stuff that has nothing to do with that. That's a conjecture, yes. So, so, like, so in the theorem of, of Luke, um, you could say, well, what happens instead of looking at the, the first Betty number, look at the mod P Betty number. And the conjecture is that that should also go to zero. Um, and that's not, that's not known, um, but certainly believed. And if you believe that, that's one of the things that says that in the torsion growth conjecture, new primes have to constantly be appearing um, because the amount of mod P Betty number is just sort of, is sort of growing sublinearly. And there are particular examples of Frank Caligari and um, Matt Emerton, um, using number theory techniques where they can actually sort of compute the amount of mod P homology in these covers. And they see it sort of grows like the root of the degree or something like that, compatible with this, this conjecture. For three manifolds or, okay, uh, reefers chains. Okay, yes, yes. So there's an example um, coming back to Michelle's talk of where you do know you don't have rapid mod P growth. Yeah, thank you. Great, well, we can be in 30 minutes for the lightning talk. And for us, let's thank Nathan again. 22 minutes.